Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of In the Pit with Lobo Tigre, or the Independent Speculator Interviews, if you will. Our victim of the day, or our guest of honor, is Ben Mossman, the CEO of Rise Gold. Uh, ben and I go back a way. We've had some interesting adventures along the way, uh, looking for gold in BC. Uh, but now Ben has a new project, new company, well, old project, new company. And Ben, why don't you tell us what you're doing and why, and then we'll go into our questions. Sure, thanks a lot. So basically this mine uh, is a famous past producing mine. It produced 2.4 million ounces at an average head grade of 17 grams per ton. <clears throat> so a lot of production, very high grade. And inside this deposit, there's two, there's two basic types of mineralization. There's the Brunswick veins, which produce 800,000 ounces at an average head grade of nine grams per ton. And then the Idaho veins, which are wrapped around the outside of what they call the greenstone block or the Brunswick block. And those produce 1.6 million ounces at an average head grade of 28 grams per ton. So it's kind of an interesting story. And this is, this is why we acquired the project. First of all, it's all on private land. So we own all the original mine holdings of the Idaho, Maryland mining company. And, and the other thing is that this mine was forced to shut down by the U S government in 1942 at which time it was the second biggest low gold producer in the entire United States. So, so in 1940, they produced 129,000 ounces of gold in that year. And what, what else got us really interested in it, um, there's very little written about it. Uh, there's no drawings of what the mine looked like that we, that was available at the time we bought it. Um, but uh, in the mineral yearbook for 1942, they had they discussed how the mine had just completed a major capital expansion to double the production from a thousand tons a day to two thousand tons a day. So they they put a brand new head frame up, uh, brand new uh, processing plant, the uh, new hoist, new compressors, all of that to sink the shaft down to five thousand feet. And at the time they were mining at sixteen hundred foot depth, and increased from a thousand tons a day to two thousand tons a day and at the time they were already doing 129,000 ounces gold a year so so obviously they did not expect that ore body was depleted and that that was a situation that um that we had when we first bought it and and the family that owned the property had preserved all the historic documents so so a very well organized operation you know they're making a lot of money at the time it was shut down they had, you know, all the drawings from the mine, uh, reports, metallurgical data. So a lot of information that was available that we've been able to put together into a three-dimensional model, um, looking through, you know, where the production was, where, where the best targets would be to drill, and then reconciling that with, with the um, existing topography and coordinate system and, and setting up sell ourselves to start drilling, which we've been drilling for about a year now. Okay. Well, it's a pretty exciting story, but of course there was somebody who got there first. And can you tell us a little bit uh, without necessarily throwing somebody under the bus or go ahead if you want, but you know, this is a, a famous story. As you say, this was a famous mine. It was shut down by World War II, not because it ran out of gold. And somebody else had it for decades and poked around and fooled around with ceramics and things. You know, what was up with that? And if the mine is such a clear winner, why didn't they drill off a resource and go back into production? <clears throat> yeah, so so, the, so when the mine shut down, it shut down in the 50s. And at that time, the price of gold was fixed at $35 an ounce. And after the World War II, the costs, of course, were increasing. So, so it became uneconomic to mine from the 50s all the way until the gold was taken off the fix in, in the late 70s. Sorry, wait, just to be clear, it was shut down by the government during the war in 1942, but then it opened up after the war again and ran for a few more years? Yeah, so they tried to open up and, and they had very little money, so they just mined the existing reserves that were already developed. And they're basically hoping that, you know, or they, they expected that the government would raise the price of gold and, and they thought it should be raised to $75 an ounce because that's what they had done in 1934. They raised it from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce, which made you know, gold mining very profitable. And, and it just didn't happen. So, so many of the US gold mines just could not make money after World War II, and, and a lot of them were shut down. 
So, so at that idol, they, they severed the land at uh, about 200 foot depth. So in the United States, you can own different uh, depths of land. So other people own uh, 200, first 200 feet of, of the property. We own everything below. So it still remains private land. And so it's that idol for a long time. And, and the interesting thing about the way that the mine was running at the time, there was a lot of competition with Newmont, and Newmont owns about 5,000 acres uh, right adjacent to our property, which is the historic Empire Star Mine. And so they didn't allow the USGS to study the Idaho Maryland mine. So, so there's big reports written on the Grass Valley area for gold mining, but um, there's no information on the period from, say, like 1920 to the closure of the mine from the Idaho Maryland mine. So, so it's been off the radar for a long time. And when the goal came out to fix uh, a group, um, which started out being an ex-California state geologist, basically found the documents, the same documents that we've been using, and they did a lease agreement with the with the owners of the property. So through various different groups from, say, the mid-1980s to about 2013, it was um, leased by the same group of people. And they started out with, with a more of a regular, um, you know, rational approach to developing the project. So in 1995, they did, uh, they permitted the dewatering of the mine for exploration purposes. So, so their plan at that time was to dewater the mine, reaccess it, get back into the old workings and do the exploration drilling from underground. So once you have got underground, you know, the drilling, of course, the holes are shorter. It's easier to drill. And they did prepare um, a resource calculation based on the old data. So that was uh, 4101 compliant for them and his historic uh, resource for us. Um, we're not too concerned. Like we don't expect that we're going to turn that resource into something that's current for us because um, we think the bigger potential is, is not the remnants in the existing mine workings, but the extension of these veins below. And so, so they got the permit in 1995 to dewater the mine. They were, um, according to you know what they've told us, is that they had the funds lined up to complete that work. You know, something in you know over 20 million dollars to dewater the mine, do extensive exploration from underground. And that was about the time that the Briex scandal happened. In I think it was 97. Which which destroyed you know the junior gold market at the time. So so they lost a lot of value in their stock. Uh, the story is that they were offered the same amount of capital at a lower price. They decided not to take it. It would be too dilutive, and um, and things didn't get better. Of course, they got worse. So so they they lost all that momentum. They let the permit expire, and the company you know was idle until about 2002 when the gold market. Um, started to improve. So at that time, they it was you know, some different guys got involved in the management. They decided that um, they would they would permit the entire mine and put it into production instead of doing you know the exploration first. So so they came out with this idea where it probably started out as a, as a kind of a neat way to get rid of the tailings or to deal with the tailings instead of you know doing a dry stack or any other um, type of conventional way of dealing with tailings, they decided to basically melt that material and turn it into ceramic tiles. And then they kind of fell in love with the idea and decided that, you know, it made a lot of economic sense that if they can make ceramic tiles, that would fund the gold mine. And, and they expanded this idea to say, like, now we're going to do a great big room and pillar mine in the waste rock basically in an andesite using a ramp from surface and it would be a large scale ceramic tile manufacturing um, project with the gold mining kind of as a, as an extra bonus, you know, in the future. So, so they started doing the permitting for that. They, they, during all this time, you, you know, they, they did a small drilling program, but very shallow drilling near the, near the original outcrop, but didn't do any drilling below the existing working. So, so, so no drilling below the workings and they, they would have got their permits, but they, um, 
they did two drafts of the EIR and turns out, you know, they had created this whole ceramic tile idea to mitigate, you know, impacts from mining, but because they use so much energy to melt the rock into ceramic tiles, it created um, their number one environmental issue was air quality issues, uh, greenhouse gases from using the massive amounts of energy to melt, melt rock and convert into tiles, which as far as I know has, has never been done before. So that became their number one environmental issue. And they went through two different iterations of their EIR. When they did the final version, um, they basically ran out of money. And so that was, you know, 2008, the market crashed. They had a big investor called Rap Capital out of London, who was their biggest shareholder. That fund uh, had a lot, you know, all these redemptions come in. I remember Rap Capital failed. selling everything. Yeah, so, so they, you know, the stock fell to a low price. They couldn't raise the money. And, and the way it works in in Nevada County is that you fund both sides of the application. So you fund the drafting of the EIR and then you pay um, the county, or in this case, because they put the factory on, uh, right on the city limits, the city of Grass Valley was the lead agency. So, so they, you have to pay for their uh, consultants to review your application. So, so that I think the price was $500,000 that they needed to give to the city to review the application. They couldn't get the money. So, um, they weren't able to proceed to the final permitting of it and and during that time lost the lease on the property you know because they had a they had a deal something I think it was around 10 million dollars to buy it out with minimum minimum payments on a monthly or quarterly basis with with quite a higher NSR you know three to six percent NSR so they couldn't re renew the renew the uh, deal on the project so they lost the project and, and the family that owned it, you know, having done this lease for all these years, you know, over 20 years, they basically decided, you know, they were just, they just wanted to get their, their money for the property and they put it up for sale as, as basically just real estate. And that's, that's where we found it. Huh. Well, that's quite a story. And I remember hearing about Idaho, Maryland during the famous ceramic phase and I just couldn't bend my mind around, if it's a good gold mine, why are we talking about ceramics? Uh, the way you've explained it, I guess it kind of makes sense given their view of the mine plan. But it seems really putting the cart before the horse, and I'm glad to see that you are actually exploring and you've got some drill results going. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how that's going, and, and then I'll ask my questions, because I, I have been following your work and I have questions. So. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's been going uh, very well. Uh, we started out, you know, using contractors. So I guess a year ago in November, we drilled the single hole um, where we got, you know, a good intercept uh, on the on the Brunswick vein, the Brunswick number one vein, uh, which was 12 grams per ton over 7.8 meters true width. So so we drilled that hole, and then you know had difficulty raising money to continue. So we were able to raise money in March, where we did 3.5 million dollars. And we drilled several more holes with, with the contractor, and then we bought our own drills. So we own two drills right now. We run uh, one. So we have a deep hole rig and, and one that can drill shallower holes. So, so since, um, I guess, April or May, we've been drilling full-time with our own employees, which has, which has cut our costs substantially. Uh, you know, it's probably half the cost versus using a contractor, and, and the productivity has also improved. So, so we've drilled 10 holes so far. Uh, five have been released, and, and every single hole that we've drilled, and the holes that we have been released so far have all been in the Brunswick deposit. But every single hole that we've drilled has hit uh, important gold values. You know, so so the so the the workings are where they're expected, the veins are are where they're expected, and we started drilling you know below the 1600 foot level is where they where they stopped mining at the Brunswick mine. Got good intercepts there. We stepped down to the 2,300 foot level. You know, we got we got an intercept there. Um, it was over 20 grams per ton over good good widths, and then we stepped down even further. We just continued drilling the hole all the way down to past 6,000 foot depth, and intercepted two veins there. Uh, one of which 24 grams over 3.2 meters true width, and then a second vein there was 11 grams per ton over two gram over uh, two meters true width. So, so basically those intercepts are almost a full kilometer 
below where they stop mining. So, so you have, uh, you know, these veins continue right below where they stop mining. They continue down to the 2300 foot level, which was an exploration level. And they, and they continue down all the way to basically as far, you know, as we'd want to drill at the 6,000 foot. So, so, you know, we expected that these veins should continue to depth and that was all the indications from, from historic work. But, um, you know, surprisingly that they, they do. And, and all those, you put all those intercepts together, you know, there's, there's quite a few, we're building quite a library of them. Um, it's, it's basically what they have mined in the past at the Brunswick mine. So they had nine gram per ton head grade. They average, you know, two to three meter, uh, vein widths. There are some, some wider areas there, um, lower grade, but wider that, uh, could become important in the future. And so, so that first drilling at the Brunswick was basically to show that yes, these veins do continue, and they continue a long ways down. Okay, so I get that. You know, you have mining down to a certain level, and you know, why assume that the gold stopped there? That's a, a reasonable target. Um, but why start with the Brunswick if the Idaho veins were higher grade? And I, as I understood it, when when you first told me about this, and by the way, to the audience, I have been on the property. Ben showed me around and we looked at what we're going to do, I understood you're going to punch through the one system and into the other. And is that happening? And what have you learned? Or if not, what's going on? Yeah, well, the very first hole, we aimed for the down dip extension of the Idaho veins. And, and the hole um, turned left. So usually the holes turn right. You know, they turn right and, and turn up dip. So we, we sorry, that sorry let me out. just let me just jump in for the viewers out there when he when he's talking about the whole turning he means it literally the, the holes are very long through the earth you're talking about a rotary bit there and it has a bias and sometimes that causes the hole to deviate through the earth you think you're drilling straight but it starts to turn on you and they have a characteristic direction because of the rotation of the drill and so this one went in an unexpected di uh, direction I do remember that and you hit gold anyway uh, sorry go ahead tell us what happened yeah, so we, you know, right from the beginning, we said, okay, well, the Idaho veins are the most important. You know, they they produce the most gold, 1.6 million ounces at the highest grade, 28 grams per ton, which, which is very high grade. If you can find more of that Idaho veins, I mean, it would be a pretty remarkable deposit. Um, but the Brunswick veins are are good as well. I mean, they they produce 800,000 ounces at nine grams per ton. And, and today's terms, you know, most mines that have nine grams per ton are calling themselves, you know, high grade mines. So 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 we we drilled through the Brunswick on the way the hole turned left um so it missed the Idaho veins but but we did get a good intercept on the Brunswick surprisingly good from what we had you know we had expected based on historic information because it was 12 grams per ton over over 7.8 meters true width you know the, the intercept length I think was around 50 meters so it was quite a good intercept and uh when we restarted the drilling we decided to do more drilling at the Brunswick, you know, because it's it's close. It's on our uh, one of our uh, industrial properties that has good access, easy to drill. You don't need any special uh, measures, you know, because because noise is basically our biggest concern with the drilling. Um, we want to make sure that you know, first first of all, we're in compliance with the law and the regulations for decibels, but also that you know we're not creating uh, problems for our neighbors, basically. So. So we, so we drilled more holes at the Brunswick while we're preparing our other pad to drill the Idaho veins because we want to get closer to the Idaho targets so we have a more certainty of hitting them. So so we drilled um, those next drilling was done at the okay, Brunswick. Okay, I get it. So like if the first hole had not deviated a different way and maybe deviated less and hit the intended target somewhere, you might have continued doing such holes, but since it's turned out to be tricky to get the hole to go where you want it to go, you've decided to drill the Brunswick for now and then move closer to the Idaho veins for subsequent drilling. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And I think, you know, basically we're, we're drilling the best targets that are available to us with the capital that's available to us. So, so you know, it's been, uh, it's been a, tough, a tough market for raising money. Um, we raised, you know, before we started doing... Um, the drilling, you know, we could raise maybe a million dollars at a time. So, so we drilled, you know, that first hole and then we had, we had a break for about three months, but you know, that was enough to get to the next stage to say, okay, look, 
we've got some good intercepts at, at the Brunswick mine, and, and it's a lower part, of, lower grade part of the deposit, but but it's good, it's a good deposit. So, so we decided to test some other veins at the Brunswick, and, and a lot of this drilling is more about testing, you know, as many of the best targets as we can. We're not focused really on drilling, you know, at, at a resource spacing or putting together like a, a calcul a calculable resource. It's more about just proving that these different vein sets do continue to depth. So, so we tested, you know, a variety of different veins, probably, you know, about six, six of the major vein sets at the Brunswick mine. Well, I'm and glad so, you said that. Sorry, let me jump in and say, I'm, I'm glad that you express that, that we're trying to prove the concept. And there's a whole bunch of different veins, Idaho, the Maryland, the Brunswick, and other ones with question marks in between. Um, because if I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking at these results and you put the drill traces on the sections and, and I'm, I'm having a hard time adding them up in my head to a zone, right, a mineable zone. But if that's not the goal, the goal is just to show, look, that vein's still there, that vein's still there, proof of concept that changes how I interpret that. Yeah. And I think I think for this this mine, I mean, you basically have you know the stork mining, this 2.4 million ounces, very good grades. So if you could replace that, what was mined in the past? I mean, you're you're dealing with something that is one of the top mines basically in the world. You know, if you got if you look at mines, um, say like Macassa or Fosterville, I mean, those those mines have something around two million ounces in reserves at 20 grams per ton. And as far as I know, you know, they're amongst the highest grade producing mines in the world, major mines in the world. So, so that, that's what we want to end up with, you know, but that it takes a certain, it takes a lot of capital to drill out 2 million ounces. So, so you Sorry, I just have to, I have to point out, you're obviously not a geologist. You're a mine engineer, because if a geologist talked about Mikasa and Fosterville and 2 million ounces, they'd be waving their arms. It's this big. <laughs> and you just sit there and calmly with a straight face say, yeah, we want 2 million ounces of high grade. Uh, yeah, that's that's the engineer on you. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's a major deposit. It was a major deposit, and and it has the potential to be that again. And that that's where we kind of started off with. That's that's the, you know, that's the focus of our business plan. And and how do you get there? I mean, it takes it takes a, they're all at two million ounces. Takes a lot of money. So so we're basically showing that it has the potential for that at this stage. So so a kind of first pass drilling. At a wide spacing, we've we've done as much drilling as we want to do right now in the Brunswick. So we've released uh, five holes. There's uh, two more in the Brunswick, and then they haven't been released yet. And then and then we drill two into this two short holes into this area they called uh, the zebra zone, which which is part of the Brunswick mine, but it's in different rock type. It's in these meta sediments, and where the 16 Brunswick vein goes into these meta sediments, which is kind of like a slate slaty type of rock. Um, it, it it turns into these wide stock work zones. So so where they were mining there, it, they found it kind of in, in 49 to 50. It it was you know 100 feet wide, almost 30 meters wide, averaging around 8 grams per ton, and that that's fairly shallow. It's about a thousand a thousand foot depth. So so we have two holes into that area, and we've just started drilling the Idaho. So we're drilling uh, hole number 10. Which is uh, drilling to the the down dip extension of the Idaho vein. So so we're finally there to where you know we were looking at a year ago, and it's taken a bit longer to get there. But but we did accomplish quite a few things at Brunswick. You know we had good intercepts, uh, and those intercepts have led you know credibility to to the idea that it, this has the potential to be a major high grade mine, and has has you know brought in more investment. You know most recently. Uh, by the amount of gold, so last week. So well, I'll, I'll so ask I, about that in a minute. I, sure. Of the targets that you're going after in the Idaho or Idaho Maryland system, I remember that you had a section that showed a tunnel that they were working on when they stopped in 1942 here, and another one on the other side, and and they both stopped in ore, and it just seemed like on the same level, both stopped in ore, headed towards each other. It's a screaming, you know, drill me here, right in the middle of that. Is that going to yeah. be tested this year or? Yeah, so that that's going to be very soon. So we'll we'll have about three or four holes into the Idaho by by Christmas. So so we're testing those. It's for it's a wide spacing, but but yeah, basically you know you have you have the Idaho one vein, which is the original mining that was done, say from you know 1860 to 1900, and that was almost a million ounces come out come out of that vein at over 40 grams per ton. And then they came back in the 20s. 
and, and a group uh, led by Aaron McBoyle came in and they put all these mines together into one big piece. Because before that, it was, it was always in, you know, they, they'd run off the claim, the vein would go off their claim, the next guy would take over the mining. So it was all fractured into these different ownerships. So he, he was the first one that came in and put it all together into one big piece. And, and so they started doing the mine underneath the one vein and had good results. And then they drifted over a little further to the east and they found the three vein, the Idaho three vein, which was pretty phenomenal grades. I mean, the average grade, according to the records, is 20 grams per ton. But what they're saying when they're mining that in the historic documents is that they had um, just no infrastructure to separate ore and waste. So, so the actual in situ grade of that um, Idaho three vein was probably, you know, double or triple that 20, 20 grams per ton and good widths, you know, at least, at least two meters wide and some of it wider. And that, that's what, that's what took the mine from basically being like a, like a, you know, bootstrapping or exploration mining around, you know, 20,000 ounces a year to becoming the second biggest gold mine in the U S was, was this Idaho three vein, which is very, very profitable. And so they kind of forgot about the, the down dip of the, of the one vein until they started, you know, getting more money and, and, you know, I guess starting to get into fleet on the Idaho three. So, so the very last years in, in the forties, they, they put a new wins in and, and you can think about it, in those days, a lot tougher to get down on the ore because they didn't have mechanized ramps where you could just, you know, go down to the next level. They had to drive winds is they're basically shafts down the vein to get to the lower level. So it's a pretty big capital and difficult thing to do. And so they finally did that. They got to the 2400 level on the Idaho one vein. They drifted, started drifting along it. And it's exactly the same geology that was mined at the past, you know, in the 1900s. It has a, has a dye base hanging wall and a serpentinite foot wall. And then you got a quartz vein there that, that's like over an ounce a ton on average. So they drifted on that. And then the final face on that drift, which is coming from the west side, um, it was shut down in 1942 and, it, and it's, it's a full face of ore and they got channel samples every six feet. And this, and where the chute starts to that face, it's over a hundred meters long and averages over an ounce a ton. So it is the one vein. It's exactly the same geology. It's right underneath it. It, it has the grade it's there. And then they lost access to that area because after the war they had, they had almost no money to do um, capital development. So, so in that area, they had, you know, all this timber work and this, and this winds, they couldn't afford to go back and fix that. So they started mining from the east side. And this is um, something like a thousand meters down strike on the east side. So they started drifting on that side. And that face is also, also full face of ore was shut down in, you know, in 1954. So, yeah, so you got two faces underneath a million ounce stope that that was graded you know 40 grams per ton and that's the mill head grade that that's not the in-situ grade that's what was actually mined including dilution you know poking around trying to find the vein all those things that's what actually was put into the mill so wait so, why, why couldn't they go back to the west side it was a mine allowed to flood or, or what happened there i mean it wasn't that long they were down for a couple of years it, it shouldn't have deteriorated that much if they maintained it yeah we think about you know, at that era, they were, didn't have rock bolts or modern ground support, so they used timber support for everything. And the serpentinite rock, it um, it swells, and so it so the timber is a rigid support, and it crushes them. So you need to – it's not a ground stress. It's more of a chemical reaction to do with the serpentinite. So when they're operating, they had, you know, a full timber crew that would go around and repair all these timbers. So when it was shut down, they, they, you know, they shut the mine down. You know, they didn't give much notice. You know, they had, didn't have a lot of notice. And at the time, uh, they were paying something like 97% of the cash flow in dividends. So, so you know, it was a different, different era from today. I mean, they, all the shareholders got all the money from the mining. And they didn't keep uh, a lot in the treasury. And the main shareholder, Aaron McBoyle, who had become very wealthy from the mine, had a lot of connections um, and, and could have raised the money to – to repair all that, all that, uh, timber work, you know, he, he had a stroke during the war and then they, they, they couldn't speak, they kicked him off the board and, and, and their attitude kind of when they restarted was that, you know, we're just going to maintain this and wait until the government raised the price of gold to $75. Uh, well, that, so, that answers another question I had is if this was such a moneymaker before that they were willing to invest all the money 
to double production before it was shut down, as you said, how come they couldn't make money afterwards? Why did they need a $75 price if they were able to make money at $35 before? Yeah, well, they, the cost of inflation was, you know, something like 10% a year after the war. So, so they, they, they had all this, they had something like 800,000 ounces in, in reserves at the time. Historical so they reserves, had, not to be counted upon today. <laughs> no, I mean those. That, that's what they had, you know, in their written books. So, so they had a lot. They had a lot ahead of them. They were really success, successful, making a lot of money. They had developed all these areas, where and, and what they counted as reserves was, you know, where they had drifts driven in the ore on two different levels, and they had some kind of sampling done to show that, you know, it had some kind of grade to it. And um, so they were in pretty good shape. And so, so after. The, you know, during this period of the war, the, the mine completely deteriorated, especially in the Idaho area, which is where the serpentinite rock is. And, and they have all these pictures where basically these huge timbers that they, they used to ground support, you know, something like, you know, 16 inches in diameter. They're all, they're all cracked and crushed. So it's a lot of work to fix all that. And they uh, just focus on the Brunswick mine where, where it was easy, good ground. Um, it's all they already developed for them. And they mined about fifty thousand ounces a year, and so so I think they eventually would have got there if they if they were able to maintain profits. But I mean, you can imagine back then. I mean, they had they either had to make a profit to pay you know for their labor, their you know all their costs, or or they would go bankrupt. So so there was no ability for them to go and raise capital to to do the work necessary to properly, you know, redevelop the mine. And, and if they had gone to, you know, to back to their original goal, which is double the production to say over 200,000 ounces a year, they probably would have still made money at that, at that, at that rate. But instead they went the opposite way. The production went in half to 50,000 ounces. And then of course your fixed costs are so much greater on per ounce and the gold price is fixed $35 costs are increasing. You just can't make money by getting smaller when the gold price is getting lower. Well, wow. okay. So interesting history. We we'll probably talk about a lot more. Let's flash forward to today. And you mentioned wanting to make sure that you're compliant with the regs, particularly noise is an issue and you want to be a good neighbor. And I know because I've been there that your neighbor is the city. I mean, you're, you're surrounded by houses and, and businesses there not too far away. And this is in California. So let's, uh, you know, confront the, the, the big C word here. California is, is not one that a lot of uh, mine investors are comfortable with. Uh, talk us through Nevada County and why should investors not be concerned that you're in California? Yeah, I guess. So the main thing is, I mean, we're, we're not in the city. It's in uh, the county. And, and so... So you, so you got uh, the city Grass Valley, and then there's another city north there called uh, Nevada City, and that's that's they're on their own entities, you know, as part of the city. And then you have the county, with, and Nevada County has about 100,000 people in it. And of course, you do have landowners in the county as well, but but they're they you know they pay their taxes to the county, not the city. So the key thing, and this is why we originally found the project, is because it's on private land. And and because a lot of you know a lot of areas all over North America and South America, you know you're leasing the minerals from the crown, and and if you have things like First Nations concerns, I mean in Canada and especially BC places like that where they haven't settled these land claims, effectively the crown doesn't even really own the land anymore. It's owned by these different um, First Nations bands. So there's a dispute over ownership of the land of which is being leased to the company. So that is a big concern. And that, and that's why I became interested in private land. And the United States, as far as I'm aware, is the only place where you can actually privately own minerals. So we own the land, we own the minerals. And because of that, in California, the county, the different counties are responsible for regulating their own land uses. So, so in Nevada County, um, because it is a historic mining area, they actually have mining written right into their zoning codes. So for example, um, exploration drilling from industrial zone land is, is an allowed use, requires no use permits, so far as you don't um, discharge you know, water off your site. 
Um, so, so for example, the diamond drill they were doing requires no permits at all. You know, so you have to you have to meet you have to um, meet the county bylaws as far as noise noise goes and things like that. So, so as far as our new uh, pad, we actually have a you know a noise wall up. We have you know consultants that monitor the noise levels. But it's pretty straightforward. And then the and then underground mining is also an allowed use subject to a use permit so so nevada county is a lead agency and that that's kind of the thing people say well it's in california but you kind of have to discount the whole california because it's not california state that is the agency deciding whether this could be permitted to a mine or not it's nevada county and nevada county because of historic mining has specifically made underground mining and allowed use and surface mining in certain zone areas so so when you decide to say to water the mine or put the mine back into production, you have to apply for a use permit from Nevada County and Nevada County is the lead agency and, and they have to comply with the California Environmental Quality Act, they call it CEQA, which basically lays out, you know, all the things that have to be put into a study, you know, it studies uh, different impacts, you know, traffic, noise, dust, you know, uh, hydrology, all those things that they have to look at by law. But Nevada County is the, is the agency that, that is running that process. And there's big advantages to the way that they do it here. Um, so you prepare, so say, say you wanted to permit a mine, we've drilled it all out. It looks like because it could be economic and you're ready to go to that production phase. You would prepare an, an application, which would be submitted to the county. So, so you pay for that cost, your consultants do it. You study all these different issues and, and how you would mitigate it. So you design this, project to be compatible with the local uh lo other other local users you know to worry about you know are we going to um discharge to a creek and what the water quality has to be to do that all those things what, is there more traffic what would be do we have to put more traffic lights in those, those kinds of issues and and keep in mind too that this is an underground mine so so it's, it's a pretty low impact as far as as far as mining goes you know you're not talking about you know big open pits or things like that so, so the big and the big the big advantage here is that once you submit that, Nevada County um, will review it, and they have their they hire other consultants to review your application, and so you pay for the cost of that, but because you're paying for the cost of that and they're using consultants, you're controlling the the pace of of this application. So, if you're if you're in another uh, jurisdiction. Where you're relying on a government agency to process your application uh, whenever BC they feel like or, it <laughs> yeah or a, a, basically anywhere else if you're on public land in the united states it's the same thing you got you know forest service or blm who are going to review this application you know they decide the pace of it they they decide do was this a priority for us or not who's going to do that who's going to do the review you know is it worth you know processing it because uh, uh, it's going to cost them money so, so that's a big thing as far as the timing goes and, and you're dealing with the people that are going to decide first the planning commission for Nevada County, and then eventually the county supervisors. You're dealing with them, and it's directly, um, you know, there's impacts to this area potentially from from the, what you're doing, but there's benefits as well. So the people that are deciding that are here; they're local, they're in Nevada County. It's not like this, the this, the governor of California who's in Sacramento, and really. You know, a project even even as potentially lucrative as this is, is small potatoes for for California. I mean, they have no incentive to uh, sure sure to to that be helpful. So yeah, so it's so it's a local level done by the Nevada County. So if you're looking at it, it's not California. You got to look at say if you're doing any project in, all, in any any in California, you'd look at it on a county by county basis. And in this in this state are uh, in Nevada County. I mean, there is a recent history of them supporting other mining projects. They permitted uh, an open pit mine eight miles east of us uh, a couple of years ago. And Newmont um, got a permit to discharge mine water into uh, Wolf Creek, which is one of the creeks around here. Um, I think it was just last year, they did it less, in less than nine months. So it's already this recent history of, of permitting so it can be done and that that and there's a lot of big advantages to being on private land in Nevada County versus 
almost uh, all other jurisdictions in, in oh, America. So I get it. There's a legal advantage in that it's it's in the code in this county. Like there's, it, you know, it is a use that's in the law as far as. So that's really interesting, and the controlling of the timing of the process is also really interesting. But you know, it's still bigger picture. If uh, just to be clear, you know, bigger picture, you put your application in, and as long as it. Uh, is compli deemed compliant with CEQA according to the county, is that it? Is the, does the EPA even have anything to say, or does it stop there? No, I mean, the EPA doesn't have any say in it. There are other agencies where you'd need, um, you know, minor permits, like California State Water Board um, and other agencies, but they follow, uh, that follows on from the approval of the use permit. So it is a discretionary permit. Like it's not, it's not a guarantee that you would get a permit to mine. It's discretionary on, on the county supervisors, but, but it is um, more of an engineering situation rather than a political. So if you have an impact to, to neighbors, if, you know, if creating a big traffic concern or, or a dust concern or things like that, and, and you don't mitigate it. So, by mitigating it, you make it so it's not an issue, you know, because you have dust control or you have traffic lights or, or whatever the whatever the case may be. You're going to have difficulties with that. But if you, if you mitigate it and you're not having an impact, then there's no reason why you wouldn't get the approval of those permits. And it, it'd be the same process for a mine uh, applying for a use permit as it would be for like a brewery or for, uh, you know, a salvage yard or, or anything like that. Where someone's proposing to do an industrial activity on industrial land that's not specifically allowed by it, which, which is most things. So it's a common process, um, even though it's mine. It's a, it's it's kind of a unique situation. It is a, an interesting and unique situation. I've I've never seen one quite like it. So you know what could be the big scary you know C word California could actually be a plus in your case because of private land on a county that happens to have mining written into the use codes. That's, a, that's an interesting situation, Ben. But that's maybe putting the cart before the horse here. You need a deposit before you can talk about mining it and permitting and all that. Um, and so far you've been doing you know, some pretty deep holes, proof of concept. How do we go forward from here? How do we find a deposit that's worth mining that's going to cost a lot of money? Yamana bought in. Um, maybe let's start with just the money and then talk about the milestones after that. You, yeah. had, you had a, a fundraising in September and you raised a, didn't seem like a whole lot. And then Yamana stepped up to the plate. How much money do you actually have now? And, and what is, you know, how much uh, drilling can we do with that? Yeah, so we just closed, or we're going to close um, the $2.5 million financing. I should close this week. So Yamana's already invested $1.75 million of that. Um, and then we have the rest um, of lined up to close this week. So, so we basically have uh, just over 2.5 million in cash. And um, I mean, before, before this kind of this last six weeks or eight weeks, uh, we've been working um, on getting this deal done with the man. So they, they had, uh, you know, questions similar to what you're asking. You know, they, they like what they saw from, you know, from, from the, from their desk or, or in Toronto. And then they sent out their senior staff, to Grass Valley for a week. So we, we explained all these things that we've been talking about in detail. You know, we had them talk to the lawyers, understand the permanent situation, the community, how things how things work um, as far as that goes. Because, you know, of course, people want to know, well, is it even worth finding right. a deposit if we can- If you can't do anything can actually yeah. Do something with it at the end. So, you know, so they were satisfied with that. They were satisfied with the geology. I mean, and it's, it's still early days. I mean, we, we have been drilling these wide space holes but uh, it's been very positive. So, so, so they invested on that basis, and and we'll see what happens in the in the future. And and kind of the near term, it's almost all about the drilling. And and so we feel pretty comfortable that we've tested the Brunswick um, to show these veins continue to depth. And and more follow up work will be done in the future to decide, you know, should we infill in different areas to start building resources. So basically, what what we're doing, okay, we've drilled the Brunswick. We've had good results there. We've tested different veins at different depths. And now we're drilling the Idaho veins. And we expect to make good progress on there before the end of the year, say around Christmas. And once that's done, then basically you look at it from, from like a, an eternal point of view and decide, okay, what, 
is the, you know the depth of these targets what's the potential size of them what's the grade so so what is the kind of the ounces per drill meter and you know and what's the cost of that and then and then you decide okay basically you can build the table and say these are the priority targets from one through ten you know as far as cost versus versus ounces because you need to build a certain amount of resource or at least have a very good idea that you're going to be able to drill out to a resource of a certain size and, and that would depend on uh, on who who was taking the project forward on what size that would have to be you know but um but that that's basically where we're going to end up at the end of spending the money that we just raised this two and a half million is is completing the first pass drilling on the major targets from the mine so we've done the brunswick the rest is going to be all the idaho drilling if that Idaho drilling is successful, it will mean a lot um, as far as achieving something similar to the historic mining. Because the Brunswick is this 9 gram per ton material that was mined. The Idaho is this 28 gram material. So if we can show that there's also this 28 gram material, and you can have you know Brunswick, 9 gram, Idaho, 28 gram. If we can prove now that the Idaho continues to depth, that's going to mean a lot for this deposit. And, and where it goes after that first pass drilling is done, we're not sure yet, but um, it will, we'll see what happens in the new year. You know, it could be um, could be that investors appreciate that the work that we've done and, and the stock goes up. You know, we can continue doing more drilling. It could be that um, you end up doing a joint venture, um, you know, because at some point you have to decide, you know, we're just we just can't raise more money at 10 cents too dilutive and then you have kind of an earning situation so so we'll see what happens um is there is there a silver credit ben is there a possibility of some kind of streaming deal for a secondary metal there is a little bit of silver it's, it's not a lot you know it's maybe maybe uh five percent of the revenue would be silver um so i mean you could you could sell some silver but i don't think that we would consider doing um any streams or or royalties at this stage like there's no royalties at all on the project and that makes it very attractive to doing deals you know such as equity deals but also um, joint ventures or things like that because it's totally unencumbered it's, we own all the land 100 percent, and then you know keep in mind that we've invested you know five million dollars canadian in real estate alone so so we have 175 acres of industrial surface land um, it was one of the first things we did when we bought the mine properties we bought the adjacent uh, industrial property, which is a, a sawmill site, and 80 acres of industrial land. So, so of like our, you know, nine million dollar bark cap, five million of that is actually in physical real estate, um, which is so, which is flat and perfect for putting a plant there and and so on. Yeah, I, re I remember that. I remember when you wanted to buy that land. So, interesting. Yeah. But, but okay. So let's bottom line, you've got two and a half million to play with. And that's still not going to get us to a resource that's going to get us to where we've really given a good thorough test to the various different targets that will then determine where we go next with this story. Is that fair? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And so, and this could be your, your Christmas present. You are, you have drills turning now or a drill turning now on the Idaho veins. Yep. One drill on the Idaho veins. And then we have, um, four holes in a lab, which will come out quite quickly. Um, uh, mostly that is the Brunswick drilling but these Idaho um, this Idaho drilling is going to be very important um, and keep in mind like I mean this this surface that these Idaho veins this target surface is a huge it's a huge area it's you know, 1.2 million square meters you know down to the depth of our, our lowest intercept so it's a massive it's a massive area to drill and so we're just basically saying look if we can drill a hole into this two holes three holes and hit it and it's there and it continues down to depth i mean more drilling will be needed to show like hey what's the actual grade of this material you know because you do have the real high grade material you have lower grade but if it's there really in any measure people that can look at those drawings and our cartoons and guys that you know geologists mine engineers you know people like like you man gold producers they don't need to see a resource number. I know a lot of investors will need to see an actual number to, you know, to understand that. But 
a lot of people can look at that data and say, you know, at least speculate to say, yeah, we got something that, that that's going to turn into something uh, quite exceptional. And, and that's what we're doing right now. So you're not going to see a resource statement or a number of tons and ounces. What you're going to see is, you know, the maps with these different drill holes, and you're going to have to basically do those calculations yourself to decide, you know, is this have the, does it have the potential to become a major mine, a major high grade mine, which we which we do think it has that potential. You're you're not going to connect the dots. You're going to provide the initial set of dots that you know it's this this big, right? and yeah. you know, and that's enough for another million ounces or another two million ounces. You know, if that fills in, then that's that's big enough for that, right? and that will be accomplished by the drilling that you have on tap for this year, the remainder of this year. Is that right? That's right. That's and right. how many holes do you expect that to be? That'd be about four holes by the end of the year. And there'll be more drilling after the year, but I think that with this first, say, three three holes, that will be enough to make a pretty good initial assessment of what we're dealing with there. Well, I, mean, I was wondering about that. that. Yeah, so, yeah, if you, if you get proof of concept, Ben, um, does it make sense to actually continue doing more of these long holes drilling from surface? And maybe at that point, if you have proof of concept, you start thinking about dewatering again. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's some advances we can do on that side of it, and we have a pretty good idea of what needs to be done to dewater the mine. We have done in February, uh, we did uh, an underwater ROV to inspect the shaft, which is actually in quite good condition because the water it has no oxygen and it preserves all the timber work. So the shaft is open, it's still there. That shaft goes all the way down to 3,400 feet. If you had to build that shaft today, surface would cost you you know a lot of money talking tens or a hundred million dollars to, to do that work. So you've got that access to the underground and we know uh, from a water sampling, the water is quite clean. Uh, you have to take out the iron and manganese, but once you do that, it becomes California drinking water quality standards. So, and then you have the historic uh, recent precedent from the last year of Newmont discharge and similar water quality to Wolf Creek, which is the major Creek around here. So, so you have all kind of the major issues already sorted out. And of course, you've got you know, the historic work done by M Gold and their permanent. So you know, you know what the concerns of the local community are, which is basically you know, there's a handful of people, you know, some wells, they're concerned about their wells will go dry if you do are the mine. I understand. M Gold basically, yeah, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm just trying to get an idea of where we go from here. And we're not talking years from now or decades from now. We're talking about next year. If you have this proof of concept, um, and you're not immediately bought out by a Yamana or somebody, <laughs> you know, right. the results are so great that you're, you're up on the shopping block, you know, congratulations. But assuming you do have to go forward, does it make sense to keep drilling from surface or, or you know, what are the odds that you'll actually, you know, think about the dewatering and then therefore the permitting and the money for that? Because that wouldn't be cheap either, at least not up front. Yeah, I mean, the permitting just say to water the mine is not... You know, it's not an excessive amount of money, so that that can be done, say, for less than five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, no, that, no, the, the watering would, itself and the refurbishment would be. Yeah, the actual physical work to do that. I mean, it's not something that you would tackle right away. Like in my in my mind, getting a permit like the dewatering permit is basically just pr further de-risking the project. You know, so so you sh you show people like, look, here's a major permit. It was done in timely timely manner for a reasonable cost and and, but and where, so where that we, leaves us is even under the best circumstances with the dewatering you're still going to have to, if you're going to do any drilling if you're going to keep the exploration going you're going to have to continue drilling from surface anyway at least for some time is that right you could drill a lot of resources from surface in an economic way which doesn't necessarily mean you have to dewater the mine so, so when you're actually going to dewater the mine, I think you're going on a path towards production where you're saying, look, we believe that we got a million ounces here or whatever that number is. And, and this getting the mine water out of the, uh, getting the water of the mine allows us to drill other targets in around the workings, do further definition drilling and learn more things from the engineering point of view to take it to feasibility to put into production. Um, so, so yeah, that, the cost of that, when you start getting to those kind of physical, you know, a physical work like that, the cost goes up, and obviously, rise is not in a position where it could consider something like that. But um, things can change quickly, you know. So, so, so you've been very uh, 
cool and responsible as an engineer, but uh, I want to put together a couple pieces from what you said in the past. You know, if you had issues with the ground in the higher grade area and they are reporting 20 grams per ton, but they didn't have the ability to prevent uh, dilution from coming in, waste from coming into the ore, you know, that's an issue for mining. And we're not mining right now, we're just drilling. So if you drill through a similar area, you might actually be able to get you know, that higher grade just in the quartz vein that they would have uh, been able to uh, report if they had that kind of, you know, grade control back then. So potentially some, you know, you're not saying this, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm putting two and two together here. Potentially we could have some multi-ounce per ton intercepts in the targets you're drilling now. Uh, yeah. And if you kind of read through, I mean, you think about how they mined back then. It was done visually, basically. So they mined on the veins. They didn't really even sample it. And and they kind of took everything as came, you know, high-grade, low-grade waste. So if you drill it out, we, you know, we don't know. If you had drilled that all up before they mined it, what would the actual in-situ grade be? But obviously it'd be very, very high because they they their average head grade was over an ounce a ton. So if the in-situ grade maybe is, maybe is two ounces per ton, and, and a lot of people that have looked at this project before us or, or you know, have kind of speculated or, or, or been negative on it said, well, look, it's too nuggety to drill. You can't, just, you can't hit it from 1,000 meters from surface. It's just impossible, right? It's too nuggety to hit. But, yeah, so, so we've kind of dispelled the whole thing. And, and it could be that, I don't know if this, is, if this is true or not, but it could be M Gold was afraid to drill it, you know, because they had this historic resource put together. They're worried, okay, well, if we drill it, and a lot of deposits in quartz veins are like that. You know, it's like nothing, 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 10 ounces a ton. Right, drill, but, for, drill for structure, but, drip for grade. Yeah, which is, which is kind of just, uh, it's almost like a cop-out to, because they're afraid to drill it, you know. But in this case, we drilled it, every hole, the gold's there. And, and it probably is, there probably is really nuggety material in there, but you don't need it to make a good intercept. You know, the, maybe if you drilled on five meter centers, we'd have something that was 100 ounces a ton in this last drilling program. But um, you may not ever hit that with a drill hole and you get it in the mining, but you don't need to hit that material to make an attractive ore body, which has been demonstrated so far. Well, we've gone on for almost an hour here, Ben, so I think yeah, that's a pretty good overview. Uh, is there anything that we haven't touched on you want to make sure that our, my viewers know about your project? I think we've covered the most of it, but I think the you know the basic fact of it is that you know this has potential to be a major ore body because it has proven that from the past mining, which is a unique situation. So it's lower risk. It's not like we're drilling holes in in, in some moose pasture hoping that we're going to hit something. We have well-defined targets, and and I think the fact that Yamana has done the investment last week says a lot about the potential to deposit. I mean, they they don't invest in things they don't think have that potential. And then the third thing is that uh, it's cheap. You know, it's uh, <laughs> trading like seven cents, less than ten million dollar mark cap, and and the land value of its own is is worth five million dollars. So it's very, very, it's a very, very cheap right now. Okay, so, Ben. Fair that. enough. Well, I wish you the best of luck with the drilling. We will be paying close attention, and maybe we'll we'll be talking soon about what you've discovered. So thank Great. you very much. All right. Thanks a lot.